Hello, my name is Matthias Schmidt. I'd like to welcome you. And in this video, we will discover the key tastes of the wine world and wine categories. So, what is going to come for this and the following videos? We will talk about different wine styles. We will learn about the different levels of sweetness that there are. We'll talk about wine acidity and the perception of acidity in a wine. We talk about different wine categories. We will give you an example of some aromatic and non-aromatic wines. We will talk about some winemaking categories, talking about whites, rosé and red wines, finally. Okay, so the myriad of wines available from different varieties and regions around the world offers the consumer a great choice of wine styles. Nevertheless, a little bit of guidance might be helpful to find your way through and also for you personally detecting the individual uh, perceived or preferred wine style. So within a style category, there can also be certain differences. For example, flavors of wines from cool region um, are distinct from uh, hot regions wine. Um, also, whether the wine has been fermented uh, or stored in oak barrels or it has it been uh, aged on the lees. Was it undergoing malolactic fermentation? Um, all of that adds further differences to the sensory characteristic and the style of the different wines and within the videos of this project you will find many many examples for that while we're going through uh, the different wine regions and wine categories that there are so all wines within a general style category will show differences in sensory characteristics um, for that category sometimes the differences will be quite small but sometimes it will be relatively large. So comparing different wines from the same grape variety and comparing different varieties are two of the best ways of familiarizing yourself with the great diversity wines can show. So the style of a wine describes, first of all, how it looks, how it smells, and the taste, um, in general, wines are classified as whites, rosés, and reds, simply by color, and further into still, without having obvious bubbles coming from CO2, or is it a sparkling product? And furthermore, we have the category of so-called fortified wines, which are in general higher in alcohol due to the fact that, um, yeah, ethanol in form of a spirit was added. In some cases, there are large differences between the tastes of different wine styles. For example, dry versus sweet wines, where the perception of sweetness is clearly making the major differences. But just besides sweetness, there are many, many other um, possible parameters making an, a big impact. So let's first of all talk about sweetness here. So the perceived sweetness comes from unfermented sugars, initially from the grapes. So fermentation was arrested on purpose or by accident. That doesn't matter in that case here. Or as sometimes um, applied uh, from an unfermented mass that was kept separate and where you, the winemaker avoided fermentation in there. So finally, the wine is adjusted in sugar level um, due to that. Furthermore, we have glycerin in wine as a fermentation byproduct um, that yeah, is in charge of a certain sweetness perception. But the same counts also for alcohol. Some heavy red wines, for example, that are analytically dry, so no residual sugar, have a certain perception of sweetness that comes directly from, from alcohol. Um, and furthermore, we have some other compounds in smaller quantities, um, like peptides, etc., in wine, that can also cause a certain sweetness sensation. 
Ethanol furthermore reinforces the sweetness of sugars, so accentuating the sensation of lightness, body and smoothness here. Um, the sweetness category is considered in terms of residual sugar and yeah, like indicated here, analytically the, the, the categorization is usually something like from 0 to 4 gram, it is considered dry. Off dry is then from 5 to 11 gram per liter. Semi sweet is from 12 to 35 gram per liter. And everything more than 35 gram per liter is considered as sweet. That's the case for wine in most cases, at least. Um, for sparkling wine, it's a little bit different. At least in Europe, we consider uh, Brut Nature. Brut Nature, sorry, or Zero Dosage, as a sparkling wine where no sugar was added after second fermentation and the residual sugar is not higher than 3 gram per liter. A sparkling wine considered extra brut is between 0 to 6 gram per liter. Here, the so called Dosage um, d'Expedition could have lifted a little bit the residual sugar here. The sparkling wine labeled as Brut can have a sugar scale from 0 to 12 gram per liter. So take care. Potentially we have here three different category, categories overlapping a little bit. So um, sometimes difficult to, to understand. It is the case for sparkling wine. Um, extra try is a range between 12 to 17 gram of residual sugar. Try, take care, for sparkling wine, definitely not analytically try. Uh, it's between 17 to 32 gram per liter. And everything considered as do, meaning mild, is higher than 50 gram. Semi-sweet is the category here in between, so between 32 and 50 gram per liter. Some white varieties especially are being considered of being more suitable for drier wines than, than some others. We'll discover that in the following videos a bit more in detail. The acidity in wine is quite important. So Acids in general here, organic acids, have many functions in wine. Um, they restrict the action of bacteria, unwanted microorganisms that could damage the wine. And on the organoleptic level, it provides a sensation of balance, freshness, especially when residual sugar is influenced, a bit more acidity can yeah, make the wine a bit more buffered or round. Um, it is also a factor to be taken into account when it is about the aging capacity of wine. So normally, the higher the total acidity, the better the wine can age in the bottle. And um, the fact that wine has a certain aging capacity actually initially made also its, its, its value compared to, to other foods or beverages. Um, the total acidity is represented or calculated as tartaric acid. Nevertheless, in wine, there isn't just tartaric acid. We have malic acid, we have uh, lactic acid and further other acids, but it's expressed, summed up, equal to tartaric acid, except from France. There it is sulfuric acid. Commonly indicated the acidity in gram per liter, we can categorize a low acidity if the total expressed acidity is yeah, 3.5 gram and less. A medium acidity wine is between 3.6 and 7.5 gram per liter and everything more than 7.6 gram per liter is considered as a high acidity containing wine. Nevertheless, it's not the pure value in terms of acidity that's making the 
sensory impact. So um, on the right hand side, we see a picture indicating where the pH of the wine is usually to be found. So in total or in general, we say wine is to be found in ranges from 2.8 up to 4.2 um, in terms of pH. And generally, it is to be said the lower the pH value, the higher the perceived acidity. So it's not just about the, the measured amount of total acidity in terms of sensory perception. It is to a very high extent also the pH value that is making here an impact. And then furthermore, how well is the acidity buffered? So residual sugar requires often a bit more of acidity. So it's actually a quite complex system here, which cannot be simplified just based to the fact how much acidity we can measure. So how to categorize wines? So um, the schemes to categorize wines are essentially three, I would say. So it's the wine color, the aromatic category, and last but not least, the winemaking process. So color categories, in general, you can say wine can be defined as a white wine without a maceration, a rosé wine with a short or limited time maceration, and a red wine, where the maceration is more complete. The maceration heavily affects the final product as it determines the amount of yeah, chromatographic and organoleptic compounds. So what can you see in the glass, but also what can you perceive while tasting it? Starting with aromatic wines here, the term aromatic simply means that when the glass is close to your nose and you can easily perceive uh, without a big effort a certain amount of aroma, it can be considered as an aromatic wine. So um, depending on yeah, the intensity, more or less, we can categorize three different levels of aromatic wine. So a general aromatic wine is coming from varieties like Pachetto, um, all the Malvasia uh, varieties that there are, the Moscato family, Gewürztraminer, for example. Um, a semi-aromatic is usually a wine coming from varieties like Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, if you see it in the New World style, uh, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Clera, the main or D variety for Prosecco production, Lacrine, Melo, Riesling, even Silvana, Kerner, and Müller Togau. Non aromatic are in general more neutral wines. Um, in general, many other varieties that I haven't mentioned yet. A typical um, variety in that category is Pinot Grigio, which is quite famous for being not too pronounced in, in terms of aroma, but it is suitable for taking up certain aromas that come along with, let's say, barrel aging or uh, vinification on the leaves. The aromatic grapes and in smaller quantity, the, the semi-aromatic ones keep their profile unchanged during the winemaking giving a profound and intrinsic sorry, uh, experience of the original perfumes. So here we usually talk about primary aromas that the wine actually gets from the grape. And this aroma is kept during vinification and finally ends up in the bottle. There are several ways of winemaking and each of them finds, broadly speaking, a specific category. So while just looking at the levels of CO2 that we can find in the wine, we can differ between still wines. So commonly speaking, all products that see less than one bar overpressure. Semi-sparkling are wines usually um, 
with a certain perceived CO2 and the pressure in the product is not more than 2.5 bar. And sparkling wine in general are categories where we are talking about 3 bar and more 6 bar uh, also possible in that category coming from CO2 derived from a second or a first fermentation. Um, wine processing, uh, furthermore, can have an impact on the um, yeah, perceived characteristics of a wine. Let's talk about carbonic maceration here. It is a yeah, winemaking um, strategy where you point out fruity, um, early, drinking, early drinking age red wines. Out of that, you can try grapes like Pasito or straw wine or Van de Pie called, um, where you concentrate the sugar level and everything else in the berry due to the fact that you make the berries shrivel, lose the water. Orange wine is um, yeah, controversially discussed uh, category, I would say. So it's coming from white wines that undergo a certain maceration, also going along with, compared to other white wines, excessive levels of oxygen. Um, fortification is a traditional way to produce wines with elevated alcohol contents, often going along with a certain level of residual sugar as well. Um, aromatization is in a certain extent, also part of, of the wine industry. So just as an example, Wearmouth or uh, Vin Chaux, stuff like that, um, go along with a certain artificial use of aromas. Um, not brand new, but more and more discussed in, in the last years is the issue of Dealkalized wines or partly dealkalized wines, this requires a certain technological input here uh, to get the alcohol out again. So just some examples how you furthermore can create different wine styles. So white wines are usually pressed after grape processing, so either doing a short maceration um, or no maceration, um, you want to extract some aromas, then you would increase the skin contact, um, but not that you would run into a fermentation on the skin. So white varieties fermented on skin is rare. Traditionally, we see it for all those amphora wines. Um, you get more yeah, darker colors, you get more phenols in and those orange wines they they play with that sometimes excessively that you get really astringent bitter wines which are on the other hand also coined by certain oxidation and then this typical amber color is coming from browning of phenols so Dry still wines can be grouped into light to medium bodied wines. Those wines have an aromatic, floral, citrus coined or herbaceous aroma, um, quite often with a crisp acidity. Usually they are unoaked or not coined by oak. Examples for that are Rieslings, Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer, Sauvignon Blanc, and some Chardonnay. There's also a category of medium to full-bodied white wines. They can have citrus, stone fruits, tropical fruit characteristics. They are usually a bit more complex, rich and textured, full-bodied. They are usually Coined in a certain extent by oak aging. Examples include wines made from the varieties Semillon, Marsan, and many, many Chardonnays are found here in this category as well. Sweet still wines can be categorized furthermore into semi sweet wines. Usually they are light in body, they are fragrant. 
they have uh, yeah certain perceived sweetness. Examples include wines made from the grape varieties Riesling and Gewürztraminer. Some of the really typical wines in that category is coming from the Mosul and Rheingau region. Sweet wines are yeah, usually medium to full bodied wines. They are rich, complex, um, luscious and often kind of very sweet, even though many of them are not really, really high in alcohol content due to the fact that some of the initial sugar coming from the grapes is not fermented completely. So examples include wines made from grapes that were botrytis affected like Riesling, Semillon or Fumint, um, typically coming from regions like Sautern um, and uh, Tokai wine, especially Tokai Asu are typical examples for those sweet wines, ice wines coming not just from Canada, also from Germany or Austria, um, are also to be found in this group as well. Most sparkling wines are also found in uh, yeah, the white category. Um, the white sparkling wines are usually a light to medium bodied uh, variant. Um, aromas and expressions can be flavorsome uh, and crisp to elegant. So either you get a bit more, uh, yeah, bright aroma driven sparkling wine like uh, Prosecco, or you get uh, a sparkling wine where the uh, varietal aroma is, is not that dominant, a sparkling wine which is more driven by yeah, high acidity and the CO2 sensation, um, like a typical aperitif sparkling wine would be. Um, you can get furthermore complex, creamy textured um, sparkling wines, um, especially after a certain time on the lees, as the lees aging is also giving some definitely desired sparkling wine characteristics, at least in a certain uh, style of sparkling wines. While you think about a Prosecco, it's maybe not that you directly think about these complex, yeasty, notes and you're thinking here a bit more about the easy drinking fruity stuff. Um, sparkling wines are made often from blends of varieties like typical Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot, Pinot Meunier as the yeah, main varieties for, for Champagne, for example. Sparkling wines labeled as Champagne, Cava, Asti, Zekt and further sparkling wines from many regions are to be found in the world of wine. Still and sparkling wine have something in common. You find usually uh, alcohol levels between 8 and 14.5% alcohol by volume, with the exception of some yeah, sweet wines where uh, the sugar level is that excessive that the yeast gives up. So many ice wines uh, do not have more than uh, six, seven percent volume as the sugar level is that high. A red wine is simply speaking defined by its color. So to achieve more color than a rosé, you need to extend the time of the uh, must or the, the juice on the skins. So usually we apply a fermentation on the skin and while the fermentation is over, the uh, mesh is pressed and you then further go on with the vinification. Um, alternative to a traditional fermentation on the skin, there are technical solutions possible like applying heat, so mesh heating or thermovinification or the system of flush detente are extracting the anthocyanins quite quickly by applying short time high intensity of heat and then the mesh is being cooled back again and can be pressed and then you get um, a quite color juice that can be vinified further on like a red wine. The drawback here is the tannin extraction from the skins or from the seeds is not the same like you would do a traditional fermentation on the skins. Um, most winemakers 
uh, do a skin contact till the end of the alcoholic fermentation. Some even extend it to get even more tannins out. That's a bit depending on the targeted wine style. If we think about white wines coming from red grapes, this is also possible, a so-called Blot Noir. For some varieties, we can achieve an absence of anthocyanins while we press the grapes immediately. Um, a typical case for that is champagne, where two-thirds of champagne's production is based on Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, actually uh, red grapes delivering mainly white champagne wines. So, um, try still wines can be categorized furthermore into light to medium bodied ones. They are crisp, have a refreshing acidity. They can have fruity, cherry notes, raspberry, sometimes even plum aromas. They are usually low in tannins and have a soft, silky mouthfeel, so not too astringent. There is usually low to minimum oak influence. Examples include rosé styles, uh, wines made from Dolcetto, Pinot Noir, Sangiovese and even Grenache. Medium to full-bodied red wines, they can have yeah, aromas that can be described like berry-like, plum, blackcurrant, licorice, spicy aromas. Um, they are usually rich and complex. Usually they are oaked, up to heavily oaked. They can have a trying, puckering mouthfeel coming from yeah, extended tannin extraction. Examples in include wines from the varieties Merlot, Shiraz, Grenache, Nebbiolo, Malbec, Tempranillo, Cabernet Sauvignon, and many, many more. You find even red sparkling wines. Um, these wines include the yeah, typical Lambrusco wines from Italy, um, but also sparkling red wines made from a range of other grape varieties, including Pinot Noir, Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon and a number of regions around the world are producing those red sparkling wines. Um, Australia's classic red sparkling wine is a sparkling Shiraz with a yeah, usually vibrant, full-bodied, complex um, backbound and um, due to a bit milder tannins, a velvety mouthfeel. Red wines are also found as fortified version. So tawny parts, for example, they are uh, wines that have uh, walnut, coffee, caramel flavor, toffee aromas from aging. Um, and in the mouth, they are usually smooth, complex, sweet, with a dry, warm finish coming from the elevated alcohol content. Vintage parts are wines that have a strong berry fruit characteristic, licorice, chocolate notes, up to coffee aroma. They are usually complex and full bodied with a firm trying astringency and a warm finish once more coming from the elevated alcohol levels. This group of wines also includes wines made uh, in various wine regions around the world, such as Australia, the US, and, and some others, and which are generally similar in style to tawny and vintage ports uh, that originally come from the Douro region in Portugal. Rosé wines are usually those that have a low intensity of anthocyanins and show, like you see indicated here in the bottom, just a slight yeah, hint that it is coming from a red variety. Nevertheless, while looking at the example to the right hand side of Malbec or even the Grenache, their uh, overlap is uh, possible with some lighter red wine styles. So how to achieve just a slight anthocyanin concentration in a red wine. So either you do a fast pressing, the red grapes will be pressed as soon as the grapes are processed, or you minimize the skin contact, not more than 
approximately two hours, but depending also on the variety and the uh, temperature of the crepe material. Another strategy is the so-called sanier, a French term which can be translated to bleeding. So what do you do from a normal mesh that should go through fermentation? You take out a certain proportion of juice. So you wreck it from there. That juice is kept separate, just small uptake of anthocyanins here. This is vinified as a rosé and the leftover, the mesh, is then more concentrated due to the fact that we have a higher extent of skin towards remaining liquid. The next point is blending. So we can blend red and white to achieve a rosé wine. In Europe, this is just legal in terms of sparkling wine, not for normal rosé still wines. So categorizing rosé wines, we see usually dry still wines. They are the most prevalent style of rosés and they are produced worldwide, with France and Spain being the leading producers. Um, we have usually varieties used for that called Grenache, Sangiovese, sorry, Syrah, Mouvetre, Carignan, Sanso, and even Pinot Noir, um, while being used for those dry rosé wines. Um, in many cases, it is a cuvee, but it can also be a single variety wine. Um, nevertheless, you also find sweeter styles of rosé wines. They are, on the other hand, not that common, like the dry ones. The topic of rosé in terms of sparkling wine is a topic of growing importance. So these wines are usually produced all over the world in a yeah, certain range of uh, varieties possible and styles possible. Most popular sparkling wine styles are Champagne, Cava, Prosecco, but even Pet Nut is nowadays also available in rosé formats. Sparkling rosés can be semi-sweet, medium-sweet, dry, or in other scaling systems from brut nature up to mild, um, with a creamy texture from fine bubbles that lift up raspberry, cherry, strawberry, citrus, and floral notes. Fortified wines, so wines that have been lifted in its alcohol content due to spirit addition, um, are also found. So rosé ports um, are available on the markets. They usually have less extraction. Um, you usually get here uh, paler wines um, that retain a certain red berry fruit. This style has less intense flavors, usually also little tannins compared to red ports. Um, they tend to be usually a bit less expensive, lower priced, color and flavor profile depends quite individually on the producer. Fortified wines, nevertheless, need to have a minimum alcohol content of 18% volume.